I think we still have time for questions if you. Yeah. Uh, can I ask? Uh, sometimes there is a message um, or article that the climate change is actually going like faster than the IPCC model predict, and that it's also um, uh, like related to how IPCC is actually a like political body. At least like there is a um, you know that there has to be consensus and there is like, scientists from like all the countries uh, of the United Nations. So I wanted to ask you whether uh, you think that the IPCC predictions, if you even like see the uh, different IPCC reports as they were going out in the past, uh, whether uh, they are accurate or whether it's going faster than predicted and whether the phased uh, predicted is different in, for example, the first one and the last one. Okay, I, I'm not sure you are not, I, I think you are confusing many things. Um, first, it's, um, it is a scientific assessment. It has nothing to do with politics, the IPCC reports, okay? There is nothing that is not proved scientifically that comes out of the scientific report. So if a government wants something to be said in the, sci in the IPCC reports and that is not true, it will not be written. So there is no... Uh, consensus. It's an assessment, it's not a consensus. So the word consensus should be re removed from the language. Uh, then what I showed you is that since the first IPCC report, climate has changed as the worst trajectory that has been predicted. And that has al always followed the worst trajectory. So we are not out at all of what has been already predicted, even when our models were not very good or we're not as good as they are today or as uh, well evaluated as they are today. Um, <coughs> so so the, 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 the only thing that we see here, and that's what I told say the earlier, is that for the extreme events, but the extreme is very difficult to simulate, for the extreme events it seems that we are under predicting the reality of the extreme events. And we don't know why, but extreme events are very difficult to uh, diagnose. Uh, and we are doing this, but there is no, for me, there is no, um, the political issue is not slowing down the IPCC process, it's slowing down the, the actions, but not the process itself. For me, we are doing too many IPCC reports because, uh, because we, it takes a lot of time to produce the simulations and, uh, and uh, we are repeating things for an increment each time, which is very small, while we should work more on, uh, on uh, refining our simulations at a very small scale, working on impacts, working on solutions of adaptations, because we are not that numerous on the world to work on those simulations and, and, and ideas and projections. And if we are there, we are not there. So, it's, uh, so for me, there are too many IPCC reports, but not for political reasons at all. It's just, uh, so I don't know whether it answers your question, because I, I think it was, you were mixing a lot of things for me, yes, but maybe I, I, I did not get your point. I, I think it does, because we said that uh, we are still within the projections, but within the like, worst projections. Yes. But and then I don't know if. But that's just because decisions, the right decisions, have not been made globally by every every government. It's not due to scientists. We are just diagnosing things. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I found it curious that you say that you think there's very little political influence on my PC reports because, as far as I know, the summary for policymakers is heavily influenced by governments no. globally, mm. and. No, that's uh, well. I, I contributed to the to one IPCC report, and I really saw it from inside. They are not, well. What they are, what they can influence, is the messages we keep in the summary for policymakers, the ones that remain in the report. Okay, but they are still the the, the the so. In any case, we have too many messages. So some messages they don't want sometimes them to be put forward, but the messages are still in the report. They have not disappeared. You just need to read the executive summaries of each chapter, and then you have all the messages that the scientists want to put forward. It's just that in the summary, some messages can just be put uh, elsewhere. But they are also very constructive. 
uh, in the formulation of the, um, of the messages. Because the uh, scientists have ways to write that sometimes are not understandable by policymakers from all the countries of the world. And that's the nice part of this, uh, of the session where governments are there, so the latest week. Uh, it's really the to uh, find the right way to formulate the same scientific message so that it can be understood by people in developing countries and people in developed countries. The only thing that they influence is the choice of uh, the topics to be, to be um, developed in an IPCC report. So there, there were three special reports, uh, one on, on land and climate, one on ocean cryosphere and climate, and one which is how to, are there solutions to not go over 1.5 degrees C? Those topics were decided by the government together with the scientists. So this is where they have an influence. On the, on the report to, uh, on which I, I worked, there was a, a wish of the government to talk about deforestation, desertification, uh, and a wish not to talk about, uh, I can't remember, we didn't talk a lot about the water cycle at that time. So, and that, that's, that's how they influence where we should focus our analysis and our diagnostics. But not then what is written inside and not the conclusions. This is purely scientific, okay? Yeah. Uh, well, first, thank you for the interesting session. Um, I just, I guess, I'm confusing a point. Uh, the, the graph, the first one, uh, the the region of the world that is uh, fast, uh, faster in heat and will be warmer. Quickly, yeah. Was the north part like Alaska and this, this one? Area? This one? Um, I guess it was one. But uh, when the areas of uh, to be inhabited and uh, will be drier, were around the equator. Yes. So uh, there is a link. Uh, yes. Um, so I just thought that the areas that would be warmer faster and the most warmer would be like subject to dry to dry. No, no, no. In fact, th this is a complex. Um, it's complex interactions between different parts and the reason why the poles are warming much faster is because they, are, they have snow and ice which is white and when the snow and ice melts it becomes dark, the surface becomes dark because you see the soil and a dark surface absorbs much more energy than a bright surface. So there is an amplification of the warming by the melting of snow and ice in the northern latitudes. And that's why there is an accelerate, uh, 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 a larger warming in the poles and in snowy regions than there is in tropical regions, for example. Then you are right <coughs> that, uh, for example, um, you have deserts uh, here and this very sandy uh, area, uh, because it's convection of dry heat, is warming at the surface faster than than a region covered with a tropical rainforest. So anything that happens on land creates some what we call feedbacks in the physics of the climate that can amplify or dampen. <coughs> anytime you have green vegetation, it's going to slow down <coughs> on land, if we keep on land. Anytime there is icy, icy conditions, it's going to accelerate. And so, so that, that's why, and, and this of course contributes to changing the winds and thus the areas where you bring water from the ocean. So there is more water that is going to be brought here. <coughs> and uh, if you, um, uh, and, and the reasons why this is drying and this is wetting is just that the, the main uh, big convection cell in the atmosphere are changing and are moving a little bit more. The, the, the area of storm that we get every winter is, are going to move north, so England is going to take more and we are going to take a little bit less in the future. Uh, so it's, things are changing in the atmosphere. Because uh, the aerosol is uh, reflecting the solar uh, radiation. If you take a 
If you take a sandy bag and you put your torch above it, you will not see the, the light of the torch below your sandy bag. If you remove it, then you see the light. It's just that dust in the atmosphere reflects, reflects the solar radiation, so there is less reaching the ground, so less to warm the climate. You see? You're just putting an obstacle between the, the, the sun and you. And these obstacles make uh, it's like if you are under the shade of a canopy. The canopy takes the, the light, not you, and you are cooling. So it's just, this, it's just a, a question of reflection of energy. It's not trapped, it's reflected. Greenhouse gas trap the, uh, the, the heat and, and send them back to us. But the sun just, it's just, uh, it touches, it goes back. So it warms nothing, it just goes back to space. It, it warms, doesn't warm the atmosphere, it warms nothing, it just, it just goes back to space. It's what we call the albedo, the, 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 the capacity of the, of the planet to reflect the energy. No, not, not very clear. <laughs> there was one question here and then one here. Yeah, I saw recently that a few, a few articles on the fact that tipping points were to be reached earlier than expected. Uh, I have that, but they, uh, no, I've, I've downloaded it on my computer this morning, so <laughs> but I didn't take the time to read it. Yeah, there is a new study uh, talking about the, the tipping point. There are several tipping points in the, um, in, in the planet. We don't really know when they will be reached, but the more we get, the warmer we get, the closer we, uh, we risk to, to reach them. So, but I guess yes, I, th I think again it's like the, the extreme. I think everything comes from our uh, underestimation of the extreme events. Right. Is that probably we also underestimate the timing of the tipping points? Because all this is just part of the extremes, and it's the hardest to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's probably the. But I haven't read the the paper. I saw I saw it I saw it fr first on the moon, and then I say, well, I have to read the papers. But no, I haven't read it for the moment. Yeah. yeah. I would like to know what is the scientific position of like PCC and how do you work like uh, ah. interdisciplinary? So which disciplines, which sciences are there and how do you oh. interact? Oh, okay. Um, so it depends on the report and it depends on the, yeah, on the, on the report. If you have the traditional working group run one report, it's essentially people working on climate so they can be atmospheric chemists, uh, people working on the dynamics, on the physics, on the surface, in the ocean, etc. Uh, on, on other reports, so for example, the one I worked on uh, climate and land, uh, there were ecologists, uh, physicists, um, demographers, um, hydrologists, uh, geologists, economists, uh, so we had it was very pre-disciplinary. Then it's very difficult because per chapter, so there is a balance between countries, men and women, and disciplines. <laughs> so if you mix all that, sometimes uh, it's very hard, but it's very, very interesting. So that's why it takes two to three years, because first you have to read an enormous amount of literature, and then you have to, to work together in order to uh, to reach the good level of uh, understanding and uh, summary of uh, the available literature. It's, I think it's easier in the working group one because you are more with people that uh, you are used to work with. Yeah. Exactly, exactly, yeah. In the next decade, well, uh, it's between 2030 and 2040. Yeah. So the next decade is 2042, 2032. So yes, it's uh, yeah, it's probably true. It's probably true, yeah. It's not we are, uh, and then it depends on how much we emit. If we have a rebound uh, post-COVID and suddenly we emit a lot, 
and with the war and uh, it can uh, now they I mean uh, for example Germany bringing opening back the the the, the fossil, fossil industry etc it it can it can be completely true yeah yeah it's possible um, in the previous five four years we have been talking more about climate mobility which is um, the um, migration or mm. refugees because of environmental in 2020, 75% of the global movements have been because of environmental disasters with, uh, and only 15% was because of uh, conflict. Okay. So I wanted to know, um, because of course um, the climate change is a huge part or driver for this mobility and internal displacement, um, I wanted to know what do you think of the efforts or the policy making efforts being made in this topic because even though the number is huge, like 30 million people displaced in 2020, but it's not, in research, it's not taken a very big... Um, I things. know nothing about research on that. Uh, it's really, really away from, the, from what I do. But I think, yeah, it's going to be uh, bigger and bigger in the future. But I, I really cannot say anything about whether what governments do is sufficient or not. Uh, and, and plus, what I n the little that I know is that attribution to climate change is very difficult to track in those displacements, in those migrations. If you want to see which part of the migration is uh, generated by climate change itself, it's really complicated. So yeah, I do agree with the environmental causes that are more and more important, but they can be also because humans have devastated their own land rather than because of climate change itself. I mean, we are doing a lot of... Uh, the, the loss of biodiversity on land is uh, very little for the moment due to climate change. It's essentially due to the use of our land and climate change is coming on top of it and it's going to increase in the future. But for the moment, the cause of the loss of biodiversity is not climate change. It's we humans of what we do to the, to the land. So it can be also the cause of the environmental pressure. So it's, it's difficult to, to, to go on that. Uh, it's very, it's very in interlinked. I'm sorry, I, I don't know how to answer this question. Yeah, uh, you've got to go. So maybe you and after, OK, sorry. Uh, do, you, do you think that the preservation of biodiversity would, would help with climate change? Or are those two interlinked in a more normal level? What is going to help climate change? The restoring? The increase, the increase of biodiversity. The oh, yes, of course. Of course, okay. yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, yeah. That, that's, that's for sure because the more you increase the, the biodiversity, the more your ecosystem is really resilient. So the more you capture CO2, the more you transpire, the more you buffer. Uh, uh, the, the, the climate uh, impact. So yes, there is a very strong link between biodiversity and climate change in the, with a win-win situation. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, I think initially I was kind of interested in what you're saying about scientific work being all political. I guess for me, I would consider all generation of knowledge to be like kind of fundamentally political. And I guess I'm interested in particularly maybe more broadly in the case of climate science in general, but why do we talk about since industrial revolution and not the development of capitalism? Because I think those two are very fundamentally linked to fossil fuels, and I think it is a political decision to pick or to name a starting point of these emissions something that could politically be named as something else that makes a big political impact. Uh, I'm not sure I completely understood, but I think the reference to the Industrial revolution is the really because this is what you see in the atmospheric record and in the ice sheets is really this rise of CO2 that when you measure you can link to, uh, to uh, industrial activities and because you can attribute this rise because you, the, there, there is kind of marker uh, an, isotop, uh, an isotopic marker of what it, where the CO2 comes from. We know it comes from industrial activity and we can correlate this rise to, uh, to uh, temperature. And so that's why we always talk about industrial revolution and not per capita, as you say, but even though it's linked uh, 
I'm not sure I, I fully understood, but. Yeah, I guess I just meant the industrial revolution being fundamentally linked to the development. Sure, sure, sure. Capitalism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's right. But, but we, don't, we don't have, um, again, in terms of scientists, we don't have a marker. And our marker is the isotopic composition of the CO2 to industrial activity and to fossil fuels. And because we can make this link, and then the link to temperature, then we link it to the industrial revolution. And that's how we speak in the scientific world. But you are right, we could change the world, but I think scientists will not feel confident talking about the way you suggest. Well, I think it is still political Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe there is a way to change the discourse and to, in order to, um, to be more um, influential to uh, Politic, politic sphere, but this this is I don't know. <laughs> but maybe you can work on that. The, the thing is, though, uh, the latest in the last IPCC report of the Group Three, they have demonstrated that some countries have been able to uh, increase their um, ah, uh, le PIB. Okay, the GDP. Uh, I'm brief, far away from me. <laughs> their GDP uh, and reducing their greenhouse gas emissions at the same time. So they are, where we are able to decouple the fact that you, you add or not to warming to the growth measured using the GDP. So there is something that can be decorrelated here while for a long time people thought that we would never be able to decorrelate uh, GDP and emissions. I don't know. I don't know. Go and look at the third report. <laughs> I don't know. But it's only related to the coupling. What? It's only related to the coupling that CO2 emissions increase, still increase when GDP increases, even though it increases less than GDP increases. Ah, okay. So it's still like, basically, you cannot produce more and, and uh, emit less CO2 according to the facts. Mm. Like so you mean that it's, it's like you mean that it's just efficiency increase rather yeah, than yeah. A, well in the report they say that it's not due to, due to efficiency but I haven't digged into the, the papers. I mean I just say that uh, emissions won't decrease if we still increase the production. Mm -hmm. That's uh, the price. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's why we talk about a sober society. Yeah. Um, so basically, I uh, wanted to ask because you worked on the report, so it's like because there's a huge contrast between the countries that um, that emit more uh, carbon, like more CO2, and the countries that actually get affected later on. For instance, Pakistan emits less than one percent of carbon dioxide, but when it comes to the effect of climate change, it's one of the biggest countries that gets affected. So while making the reports or suggestions to policymakers, is this taken into account? For instance, is there a chance for the countries that are emitting more carbon dioxide? Are they going to be maybe taxed more to compensate for the damage that are being done to the countries that that, that's, we did not discuss this at all in the report I'm, I was working with. with uh, they discussed this, I think, in the third group. Uh, th that's all part of the, of the, this comes into the politics. That's not science for us anymore. Sorry, but in the policy suggestions or the, the, in the report in the uh, yes, I think there are policies or suggestions, but I, I, don't, I don't know this part of, of the reports. Uh, it was not in the part I read, I, I worked on, and in the latest one that occurred, that's what they do. But I haven't, I, I, I think I cannot even read those kind of, pa of papers, so I, I don't know. But yeah, it's part, I mean, the idea is really to make suggestions on, on the policy uh, decisions. There is a break also, you can still discuss that. We can take one or two more questions. You decide that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.